Book club. Who's ready for book club? Kathy Kirsten and I read The Good Earth by Pearl S. Buck. It's a Pulitzer Prize winning novel that was written in the 30s. It was amazing. I started reading the book and realized I'd read it before, but I read it again and it was so well written. It was such a great story. It takes place in China in a culture I don't know anything about. And it was an effortless read. So if you're looking for a really good read, The Good Earth by Pearl S. Buck would be a good choice. Um, We loved the book. We had a great conversation about it and about kids being in college and their first year in college and our Girl Scout troop. And, you know, you know how it is when Kathy and Kirsten and I get together. We just chat. So it was a good chat. Our next book club book is going to be, because the feature film is coming out, is going to be Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret by Judy Bloom. I read this book when I was in middle school. I think almost everybody read this book when they were in middle school. Every girl read this book in middle school. And James L. Brooks is putting out a movie. Rachel McAdams is starring in uh, this James L. Brooks movie, and I can't wait to see it. So we're going on a retreat this coming weekend with our Girl Scout troop. So we're going to listen to this book as a troop, and then we're going to take them to the movies. We decided this on this podcast. They don't know this yet. So if you know anybody in my Girl Scout troop, don't tell them. Um, but it should be fun. It's a quick, easy read. It's a classic. It's a staple if you were raised in the 70s and 80s as a girl. So I'm looking forward to reading this book again. I haven't read it since I was in middle school. So That'll be fun. Thanks for coming back every week. Thanks for all your... I get so many great comments about book club. I always... I'm insecure about my book club episodes because I always think nobody wants to listen to us talk about what book we read. No one wants to hear that. So thank you for all your comments to the contrary, saying I don't read the book, but I still like to hear you talk about the book and it makes me kind of feel like I've read it and I like that. So thanks for those comments. Birdieboyproductions.com is the website where you can find Wife the Party. If you'd like to send me an email, you can go to that website and click on the tab. If you haven't already bought your tickets for The Machine Movie, May 25th, the movie's coming out, themachine.movie, to get tickets in advance. They're actually selling tickets right now. So check it out. It's I'm super proud of Bert and I'm really proud of this film. They did a great job. It's really funny. Thanks for coming back. I hope you enjoy this book club, The Good Earth with me and Kathy and Kirsten. Yeah, all these, uh, my dad went for his cardiology follow-up visit and I was like, call me as soon as you're out. Nothing. Yeah. I've heard nothing. I'm like, dude, you've been dealing with a, cardio- a cardiology problem. For over a year now, I've been with you in it. Just freaking call me. Call me when you're out. That was the thing. Like, I called my mom today, and this all happened on Monday. Oh, my God. It's Thursday. It was Friday. She's been calling me, like, rapid fire. I'm number 27 on the list. I'm number 22 on the list. And I'm like... You've been number 27 for four years. Like, I wouldn't get super excited. No, now she's still number three. So I don't understand how this is. Anyway, she doesn't really ask questions. So when I ask her questions. She has no idea. She has no idea. And she gives me the like, well, my daughter's sister's cousin's whatever is connected. (laughs) Okay. That helps. My daughter's sister's cousin's mailman's (laughs) dog trainer has the number. (laughs) Correct. Yeah, that's crazy. Uh, 70s is the new team. I think. Uh, <laughs> they're just, they're just rebelling team. by just going, mm, I'm just going to either starve you of information or bombard you with information. Just and it the won't way be the, the right teenagers. Yeah. yeah. It's not even the right information. Yeah. Well, I did go to the one guy who was at Peachtree City at the corner of, and I'm like, I don't know where the fuck that is in Peachtree City. What was his title? I don't know. <laughs> okay, what well, was his specialty as a cardiologist? Well, I don't know. But you know exactly where his office is, the corner of Peachtree City <laughs> Drive. And, and I'm like, I like I need that information, Jimmy. There are pains in the butts, right? It is challenging, right? Yeah. I hope we are better <laughs> when we get older. I don't know, but. I hope so too. Well, one thing is we have the opportunity to start taking care of ourselves now. Um, like by working out or your diet or regulating your sugar or drinking less or whatever, fill in the blank. We do have the opportunity to do it now at watching our parents struggle, maybe with things that they could have done better. You know, um, 
we were talking about Sandy's mom, and she is very overweight. Sandy's mm-hmm. definitely not overweight and not working toward being overweight. She's working out regularly and eating well. Her mom, her family has a history of diabetes. She's very conscious about her sugar. I think that's just what we all have to do, mm-hmm. just to kind of look at our future and go, I'm not going to do that, right? Because a lot of the things I think some of our parents end up having is preventable. It's just a lifestyle choice. It's not everything. But some things, right, are just like drink less, eat, don't eat cake every meal, you know, um, kind of simple workout. Even the falling with her mom falling, I thought to myself, uh, the one good thing about my dad is that he takes a note pretty well about his health. And uh, Mikkel, my trainer, has said always the number one danger for elderly is falling. Yeah. So what we do now at in the gym now in my 50s is we work on falling like this is balance, coordination Mm -hmm. and joint strength, because he was like, what happens when you fall when you're old is your joint strength. You may have awesome biceps, but it's the joint strength that matters when you hit the ground. Mm -hmm. So I was like, well, what can I tell my dad to do? And he was like, stand on one foot and then stand on the other foot. And then stand on, he was like, even turn your toothbrush on. It's two minutes, 30 seconds on each foot, twice, and get the foot higher and higher every day. And that one activity improves his ankle, his knee, his hip, and his balance overall in just one, in two minutes every day. That's so simple. And I'm sure nobody's parent, my dad didn't think of that, but he started right. doing it the day I told him. And he's like, I can hold my knee really high now for two minutes, <laughs> really high. He's super proud of himself. It's such a simple I mean, I think the whole world should know that. That's so yeah. asininely simple. I was thinking I was at the park um, recently and I watched a little kid um, walk on that, like sort of a, you know, balance, balance like beam. like yeah. a balance beam. But it was it was just like the the wood that was like separating the path. And I was like. God, all kids naturally do that. They all yeah. gravitate towards that, whether it's on the curb or anything that could be a potential balance beam. Yeah. They need to walk on it. And I was like, when is the last time that I have walked on the curb like that? I mean, never. I mean, my dogs do that. They, My mm-hmm. dogs naturally do that. They yes. want to walk like right along the curb like that. And so I walked on this, this wooden yeah. <laughs> beam. Just I was like, I think I need to walk on the balance beam more often. <laughs> <laughs> but to, for me, it was like more of a sense of feeling like, wow, why do kids do that naturally? And why do we stop? Right. Mm-hmm. But why do you know why we stop? Well, why do you think we stop? What are you Because it's play. Uh, like, and we don't yeah. play enough. Yeah. Like, I think that's what we're somehow being, it shifts. Yeah. You we're know? being mature. Right. <laughs> yeah. Especially for girls. You know, they say there's a definite time when it's not okay for a girl to play anymore. Mm-hmm. It's not acceptable for a girl to play. Guys can still play uh, <clears throat> a bit longer and a bit differently than girls can play. It's not acceptable. You got to be a lady, a little lady. Or a, in a sport. Or in a sport, yeah. And not just like yeah, dancing in an open field for no reason. For the heck of it. You know. I have a daughter a seconds away from going to college who is very upset about this idea of becoming an adult and Mm -hmm. it comes up all the time. And I keep saying, nobody's asking you to be an adult, (laughs) right? (laughs) Who's asking you? But I think it's just feeling that pressure from everywhere of like, you're almost 18, 18 is an adult. And you know, what's in it, what is adult in her mind versus Really, does anybody look at an 18-year-old as an adult? Other than by law, yes. Yeah. Like, you can go to right. prison. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but And you can vote. But you don't have all... You can join the military. Yeah. But you don't have all of the responsibilities and privileges of adulthood. It's not like the clock strikes midnight and suddenly the world opens up to you. There are some things... I said, it, like, all of life is just baby steps towards something Mm -hmm. and there's no finite or quantifiable moment when you're an adult and when you're in school you're not really an adult um so yeah being an adult feeling that way too though yeah Yeah. georgia did too yeah she i think it's like a natural progression where they're like i'm not ready i'm not ready i can't do this i'm not ready to be an adult and it's like well okay 
you're not actually an adult. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Don't, don't confuse yourself. Like, right. I know you're not. Yeah. Adult adults don't get a month off at Christmas <laughs> and go back to their parents' house and have them do their laundry. No, or you know? three months off in the summer. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. or spring break. Mm-hmm. Or yeah. pay all their bills or, yeah. right, yeah. you know, still. Or have a meal plan. <laughs> I want a meal plan. I want a meal plan, too. I'm so badly. Yeah. That would be so great. I know uh, I was driving to Drop Squad with Sandy, and she was telling me, like, a couple days ago, she was telling me how um, this is, you're going to go, yeah, no shit, Leanne. But she was reading an article about when adulthood actually happens, and that, adulthood as we think of it being fully responsible and fully on your two feet own two feet possibly owning a house but definitely having a household that you are fully responsible for whether you rent or not is happening in the mid 30s now as opposed to our parents you know my mom and dad got married three weeks out of high school and were completely self-sufficient not relying on anybody at my i mean my mom had a, was 19 and he was 20 when they got married. So the the juxtaposition one generation yeah. between like I was on my own really without getting any help from anybody by my mid 20s. Mm-hmm. Um but I definitely was not in my early t- I was not 19 on my own. And to think now it's like mid 30s is that such That seems really huge, late actually. I would have guessed late on 20s my own. but Wow. On their feet, fully taken care of because I guess what the article she was reading said, obviously this is second, third hand information from someone who English right. is not her first language, <laughs> but so take for a grain of salt. But what she was saying was financially it's just so much harder to be fully mm-hmm. self sufficient than it was even ten years ago. That Absolutely. to own a car that you've bought by yourself entirely to Rent an apartment that you can afford by yourself entirely. I mean, maybe with a roommate, but you you see, yeah, yeah, you yeah. get the gist of it. Uh, to pay for your health insurance, to pay for your basic needs, is so difficult now that they're mid thirties before they're really adulting all the way, um, and that kids are choosing to live with their parents, mm-hmm. not necessarily all of them to be a moocher. But to save money to buy a house, to really be as an economical choice, to to live in a place where they're supported so that they can yeah. amass what they need to get to the place where they can stand on their own two feet. So just a different ball game. Don't you think that's true? Yeah. yeah. Well, and it's like, you know, housing prices, like I know, I know they're different in different parts of the country and in different countries, but certainly here, there is no way somebody i mean unless you are independently wealthy and like have generational wealth from your family there is no way that somebody in their 20s could own a house no, <laughs> it yeah. just it's just not going to happen here and then on top of which like there are just so many expenses that even we didn't have when we were getting out of college like um cell phones yeah <laughs> and internet plans and like e- laptops and whatever like uh-huh. i mean having a laptop was like a luxury back yeah, in the day right. and now it's an absolute necessity for most jobs mm-hmm. many jobs mm-hmm. i guess not all it's true yeah that's true yeah. um my plumber i love my plumber uh <laughs> his name is austin Stephen was my plumber last week, by the he way. He was. He was, yeah. I bet he was, Kathy. Did you lay some <laughs> okay, pipe? Okay, that's not what I meant oh at all. Oh, my God. He was laying plumbing some pipe, Stephen. And he oh my God. actually uh, was amazing, <laughs> shockingly. I was like. That's what she said. <laughs> okay, I mean... never mind. All right, I'm not saving you anymore. <laughs> you you know, can cough on the mic all you want. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, Stephen was your plumber last week. What Whatever. was wrong at your house? Oh, God. I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to be <laughs> much plumbing. To like it was, I don't know, something that like I gave up on like, I don't know, hours into the project. I was like, let's just call a plumber. And he refused. He like was determined to fix it himself. And did he, he fix did. it? Yeah. Amazing. I know. I'm impressed. Yeah. He's a man so, of many gifts. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, tenacity and stubbornness being yes. the top of the list. But well, he is a problem solver <laughs> like that. He really does want to do it himself. <laughs> Genuinely, I think he gets a, a lot of triumph out of that. Uh, yes, he does get a lot of self-satisfaction. But He does. But I love my plumber. He's young. He could be my son easily. Um, I don't know how long he's been a plumber, but 
um, I texted him because I needed some work done. And he texted me back. He was like, perfect timing. I'll be there tomorrow. I've been upstate in this college. And I was like, what? You're a plumber. What are you doing? And he was like, plumbing's just not enough for me. I'm getting my degree as an electrician. And I was like, holy shit. Good for you. He just had a baby. He was like, he sent me a picture of him and his baby. And he goes, this is why. Got to do it for my girl. And I was like, that's amazing. That's some, that's some go get it, you know, mm-hmm. from this kid. He's, oh. it was pretty impressive. I don't know why I'm telling that story, but I was really impressed by him. He's just really cool. Cause he, he showed up the first time at my house and I was like, you're not the plumber. <laughs> you're like the apprentice. You're like 12. <laughs> what, what? And he's like, no, no, I'm the plumber. I'm, it's me. <laughs> but I was really impressed with him. Go, you know, that's just not done enough. And that's a comment on he can't make it work just as a plumber. He's got he's amassing mm-hmm. more skills. I guess electricians make more money than plumbers. I don't know. But anyway, should we talk about this book? <laughs> sure. Sure. Did you like this book? I, loved yeah, I did. It. I yeah. liked it a lot. Yeah. It was fun to read something fiction and easy and I don't know like it just she's so good oh, she, she yeah I mean she made you feel for particularly obviously you know the main character like you either really liked him and felt his struggle or you're like dude you're an asshole yeah. you know what I mean like it was I don't know she did such a great job writing this book yes. I liked it a lot it's the yeah. good earth by Pearl Buck it is mm-hmm. and it won a Pulitzer and it deserved it right yeah it was good. I resented no pages, even though it's longer than, you know, me. <laughs> I'm the book snob about it. I want it to be short, but um, I resented no pages at all. I was, I actually, at the end, I was sort of like drawing it out. I made the last 15 pages last two days because I was like, oh, I don't want it to be done. But yeah. Do you know uh, anything about why she wrote this book or any of that? You know anything about her I read history? the intro to it. Um and I was sort of surprised, actually, um, particularly after reading the book. I was like, because it didn't feel like it was that um, groundbreaking of uh-huh. a book. Uh-huh. But knowing that it was written way back in like 1938 or something, or something yeah. right? Yeah, that's what I remember. Um, and just to have like such a human perspective on a different culture like mm-hmm. was unthought of back then, which now we read stuff like that all the time. So it didn't seem that, um, I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, yeah I did but, too. You know. On a different culture. And also, yeah. um, the, the main character, the protagonist is a man. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And the author is a woman. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So the book, the good earth is about a man I can't believe I'm going to say this out loud. I've already forgotten his name. What's his name? Wang Lung. Wang Lung. Wang Lung. Wang Lung. Something like that. Yeah. Wang Lung. Okay. I was going Wang Chung. No. <laughs> Wang Chung. No. That's all my brain was saying over and over again was Wang Chung. I was like, we're not going to have fun tonight. It's not Wang Chung tonight. I think it was Wang Lung and Olan. Olan. Yeah. Olan. So mm-hmm. it's about their... Really, it's about his journey through life, right? And his journey through being a young man and getting married and working the earth and poverty and famine and um, children and ancestors and parents and uncles and marriage, marriage and mistresses and just everything that happens in this gentleman's life from uh, right before getting married until until the end. So, Mm -hmm. um. And it's set in China. We don't really know what year it is. We know there's no automobiles, um, that he's still doing things with oxen and they're walking places. But they do talk about in one part where his nephew's going off to war, war the um, foreign fire machine. So that obviously is a gun. So and they have a train. And there's so, a train. You know, there may be automobiles, just not in his rural area. Not even in the city where mm-hmm. they went to for famine. I don't remember. They but, were all Oh, yeah, rickshaw. they were doing the rickshaws. Yeah. So it's sometime, mm-hmm. probably turn of the century sometime. And I don't know when automobiles showed up in China. Yeah, so, I'm not really clear on the... Yeah, timing. The, yeah. But it's definitely not modern times, right? And... um like you said, I'm just going to explain it. But it doesn't feel like it's so old no. either, you know? No, I was, I, it didn't feel old at all. Yeah. It felt like she wrote it last week. Yeah, exactly. You know, 
I, it didn't feel like she wrote it in the 30s. It was timeless in that way. Yeah. Um, but the uh, Pearl Buck um, was from, was it Kentucky? No, West Virginia? Remember. Virginia? Somewhere up in there. Was from there. Her dad was a minister and they moved to China so that he could witness and could, you know, convert people to Christianity. Lived there till college age and then she moved back to Kentucky, West Virginia, wherever. Went to college and then went back to China. So uh, she wrote this book having really grown up in this culture. Um, and a woman wrote, like you said, wrote this man's story. It's just so brilliantly done when you know all those factors that mm -hmm. she um, grew up definitely a white person inundated in a very different culture than her own. I thought she wrote it. I, I, I'm not Chinese. I don't know if this is accurate, so to speak. Mm -hmm. If you were Chinese, if you would read this and go, yes, this is spot on. But for me, I really did feel like I was like peeking through the curtain of this other culture and seeing how they really work. Yeah. And just in terms of historical fiction, like I don't know a lot about Chinese history, but it really seemed to go through an awful lot of um of Chinese history throughout his life. It's like all of the, the history of the country throughout, um, Wang Lung's life. And, um, that usually is the curse of death for me in a book that I'm not really that interested in historical mm -hmm. fiction. Like I'm not that interested. I'm, I'm interested in history, but it's just, it doesn't, it doesn't grab me narratively usually. And, um, you, and I was, I was in it. Like I was very invested the whole time I was, I really enjoyed it. She, yeah, she did a good job. Mm -hmm. She did. You were going to say something. I think. No, I was just going to agree with you. It really felt like she accurately described. And again, I don't know how accurate it is. It feels very authentic yeah. from this white woman writing about. Uh, yeah. Chinese not just culture, writing but... about a, a man and um, a, a, from a point of view of a, a male Chinese <laughs> person but also just like from a farmer like a, mm -hmm. and from a poor farmer and um all the and then all the other things that he becomes he becomes the rich landowner mm -hmm. and then and just all of the class um struggles there too i feel like she, it, it feels like she nailed it yeah. <laughs> it feels like she it nailed does. it yeah, yeah it does and it was an effortless read yeah mm -hmm. she writes so beautifully that you don't even i i would forget i was reading does that make sense? <laughs> like I'm reading yeah. and I'm so in the imagination of what she's saying that I forget that I'm actually reading. Yeah. It, and she's very kind of clear both mm -hmm. about place, um, but also about like emotion. And, yeah. and especially from a man who is re often seems fairly emotionless. And yet she got us into the emotion yeah. of what he was feeling versus what he was showing. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was great. Yeah. So what do you think about his relationship with Olan? Oh, I loved Olan so much. And she just, she was the character that just breaks your heart. Mm -hmm. You know, um, just the idea, first of all, that she, well, that women were slaves, were just called slaves. You give we're birth, sold. Well, yeah, yeah. You give birth to a girl and it's like, oh, it's just a slave. Like that was his response when he has his first daughter. Mm -hmm. Oh, just a slave. And, um, but then also to be in a physically unattractive to not pretty, like to not have the, these standards of beauty, um, that it, just the way that she was abused and, and taken for granted and taken advantage of for her whole life. And she was such a good wife and mother. Like mm -hmm. she just did in person, everything in person. Yeah. And just, oh, I could just cry thinking about her, like just on her deathbed, just going back to like, I know I'm so ugly and, um, and her giving birth to all of those kids alone oh in God. a room alone, yeah. like that alone, just giving birth to one child alone. Can you imagine that with no help whatsoever, just completely alone and then giving birth to that, to their daughter when, when they're completely impoverished the extreme famine and then mm -hmm. they she being special needs no well, the, the, daughter, daughter, that, the, the other daughter, daughter when right. when he comes in to see he he hears a, a baby cry and then he comes in to see her and meet the baby 
And she says, oh, the baby didn't make it. Oh, and there's bruising right. yes. on the baby's yeah. neck. And Yeah. Can you imagine? Yeah. Doing that. But it's, it probably was the most no, merciful thing like, to do. I mean, like, how strong was death. she in that yeah. moment? Do you know what I mean? Like, as terrible as that is, like, she is just the strongest character in yeah. this book, without a doubt. Like, Absolutely. everything yeah. that she did, like, was for someone else. Yeah. You know, and she put herself through extreme sadness, pain, whatever, for yeah. the benefit of someone else. She who did. didn't always appreciate it or, who, or didn't even or understand. almost never appreciated yeah. it. Like okay. even and even when she was dead and he was feeling <laughs> regretful for not appreciating her, he was still thinking, well, she really wasn't attractive. Like, <laughs> yeah, right. It's just like, huh? Like, she's dead. She's gone. <laughs> yes. But I think she stayed with him. I yeah. think that once she died, part of him died. And I don't think he really ever maybe, it, I don't, it wasn't articulated in the book. He never had a realization that that was going on in the book, but he was never the same. And he seemed to stay with the land and separate himself and mm-hmm. wasn't as interested in Lotus, his mistress who had fattened up and, you know, wasn't worth two dead flies most of the time, but he, he, he seemed to have not understood himself how much she meant to him, and how much yeah. how invested she was in his dreams and loves that he cared about the land, and so she cared about the land, and she was literally breaking her back even while pregnant, even while in labor, in labor, yeah, in labor, like and you know, carrying harvest. these other babies, yeah. helping him harvest working her ass off and she did all of this because she didn't she never second guessed his um like his needs and wants she was just a hundred percent there for him and wow it just it felt like a, a metaphor for uh women and feminism and and everything of just like is this is this all there is yeah right <laughs> that you just kill yourself for literally kill yourself for this guy do everything and then that's it <laughs> yeah bad bowels took her down right <laughs> vitals isn't that what she said yes. my vitals my, yeah. or something like that anyway yeah i thought she was just a beautiful character and sad she made mm-hmm. me really sad and made me angry at him and made me not like him mm-hmm. even though i liked him i also didn't like him for mm-hmm. i wanted him to i wanted him to have a moment where he just was like she was the best because she was mm-hmm. ugly or not, you know, big boned or not. She's the real deal. Mm-hmm. And everything else was just noise. You know, it's just kind of noise. And I, I, I did the like. fact that she wrote that struggle, like he did struggle with it a little bit, like not as much as I, I think any of us would have liked. I would love that realization for him to have. But I don't know. I think it was pretty authentic and genuine. Like he was very flawed Mm -hmm. and didn't see how amazing this woman was like, and he kind of knew it, but not enough to do anything about it or to even acknowledge it, you know? Yeah. Like there was definitely some compassion in him. You know, he was a a good person in certain scenarios, Mm -hmm. right? Like he saved that child slave that he couldn't, he just couldn't bear. He saved his daughter who yeah. was mentally retarded, I'm assuming, like we don't really know, but she clearly was what they called a fool yeah. um, and nonverbal, right? So yeah. like he, you know, he, there's a lot of things that he did that made him really human and you felt connected to, even though he was still kind of a jerk. Right. And you know? he just, he forced her to do so much. I mean, he was, yeah, he was such a quote unquote good guy that he couldn't kill his beloved pet ox. ox yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I know it was a work animal, but also his pet. I mean, yeah. it lived in their home. It slept in their home. Yeah. And he, when they're all start literally starving to death, he could not bring himself to kill it. And so she had to do it on top mm-hmm. of everything else that she was yeah. doing. I mean, and then in the end, even when they're rich, they're rich, 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 rich. And she's still cooking all the meals and cleaning and sweeping. And then she dies and their place goes to hell. Right. 
<laughs> Sounds like my household, right? Isn't it yours exactly. too? You're like, dude, we go away for a weekend and then, ah, what happened here? But it was, I was just incredulous in that he didn't have the wherewithal to realize, oh, <laughs> we're rich. Yeah, right. <laughs> Somebody else could right. be sweeping the kitchen right. for her. She should have help. Yeah. My God. Yeah. yeah. And he took her two pearls. It was. Oh, oh my God. Oh. That was the worst. I was so mad about that. Right. I was so proud of her when she asked for them. Yeah. I was like, oh my God, do it, do it, do it. Yep. Like you could just feel it. I was like, please make sure you say it out loud. But yeah, he was such a jerk. He took them. Yeah, for, she's the part that's going to really stay with me from this Olan. book, Olan. Yeah. She was great. Mm-hmm. It just shows how, um, just how arbitrary it all is. These, these gifts that people are born into, whether it's like a man's height, like men who are really tall tend to be more successful than shorter men. There's studies on this. Yeah. Um, women with symmetrical features or who are thinner or whatever. There are lots of people like there are lots of people who cannot um, stay, be thin. Yeah. Regardless of how their diet and exercise Mm -hmm. and whatever. And, and like for her, for Olan, it was her, you know, whatever. She was big bone. She was plain looking. She had large feet. Like she she didn't have have bound bound feet. Right. Yes. Yes. And so of course that's, gone out of style and that's not <laughs> happening anymore. So it was just like, you know, to imagine this woman who is just a powerhouse yeah. who just mm-hmm. worked so hard to imagine her in another era and like in another time and another place. And like, what would her life have been like? Yeah. What would it have been like? Maybe that's pearls like feminism coming through, right? Writing this really strong female character. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. I know you guys know I've been in therapy for years. I've been in therapy on and off since I was about 23 years old. And therapy has meant different things to me at different times in my life. At 23, it was about me figuring out why I was unhappy and what things, systems, relationships, opinions, thoughts I had in place that kept me unhappy. And that was really hard, but also really liberating. And then as I got older, my therapy purpose has changed. It's been kind of about having a mentor sometimes. Sometimes it's about having a relationship with someone who's only there for me. Sometimes it's about problem solving. Sometimes it's about parenting. But therapy can be whatever you need. It's a support system. And you know, therapy can work for you uh, for whatever you're having trouble with, trying to figure out a new job, not understanding your relationship, just not understanding yourself. Having a safe place to just complain and vent is another purpose that therapy can be great for, because if you can put it all in one place, you can walk out in the world and feel better about everything else. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime at no additional charge. Find more balance with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash wife today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash wife. Today's episode is sponsored by the revolutionary cookware company, Hexclad. I mean, I love this stuff because you know why? This is a nonstick pan. But it doesn't look like any nonstick pan I've ever seen. It has a patented hybrid technology that not only prevents food from sticking to the pan, it also has incredible temperature control and durability that lasts a lifetime. Now, let me tell you what that means to me. Do you know how many times I have to replace a nonstick pan because my dummy husband will put a metal utensil in that pan? The first time he uses a metal utensil in a nonstick pan, it's in the garbage because you can't use it again. He does it all the time. It drives me nuts. Well, the hex clad, you can use a metal utensil. Life changer for me. I just gave Bert a brand new set of nonstick pans, name brand will remain nameless, for Christmas that he's already scratched up. So they're garbage. So 
Hex clad is like my new favorite thing because you can't really hurt it with a metal utensil. And that is always my biggest complaint with nonstick pans. It's so nice to cook with. I have really enjoyed this set of nonstick pans. Hex clad truly checks every single box when it comes to cookware. They are metal utensil safe, dishwasher safe, and oven safe up to 500 degrees. They're non-toxic and induction ready. It even stays cool. It even has a like a stay cool handle so you can saute or cook. You don't have to worry about getting burned. The handle stays cool. It's just an awesome set of cookware. Some would say that Gordon Ramsay is the toughest critic in the world. And these are the pots and pans he uses. Get 10% off with the code WIFE at hexclad.com. That's 10% off hexclad.com with code WIFE. Hexclad is spelled H E X. C-L-A-D, hexclad.com with the code WIFE. Bon appetit. Let's eat with Hexclad's revolutionary cookware. I found interesting, since we followed him all of his adult life, um, when he has the money and goes to town and meets Lotus, and you know what's going to happen. You know where this story is going and how disappointing that's going to be. But it is, I think, such a comment on what happens for men sometimes when they get to a certain age. They have like a midlife crisis. They get bored. They they get insecure. They feel like empty because other things haven't filled them up. Whatever you think the issue is, it's something that inarguably happens a lot. For men, it doesn't really happen for women, I don't think, in the same way. We have menopause. I think that's our kind of midlife readjustment of things. And in going through menopause, the things that, for some people, this may be really ignorant talk to. So please forgive me if I'm just speaking very ignorantly. But men are visual creatures. Women's bodies change. Like you were saying before, some people, no matter what they do, can't be thin. Uh, Olan, no matter what she could do, would never be pretty. And at a certain point, I think he felt he deserved a a trophy wife, an arm candy, and he was never going to get that from her. And I wonder if that happens, definitely happened in the 30s when, you know, misogyny was different even than it is now, even though we still have it. But anyway, I just, when that moment happened, I was like, this is a comment on what tends to happen sometimes for men as they get to a certain age with a certain level of success, not realizing that success has risen somewhat on the back of the woman they've married, the children they've made together, the um, drive to succeed because you have this women and, and children, you know, most men when they have kids become very driven to provide and then they provide and then they go, where's the shiny thing? <laughs> not realizing <laughs> The not shiny thing is what got you to the place to want the shiny thing. Yep. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? A hundred percent. That's yeah. what that's what happened. I think that's a hundred percent what happened there. What happened Maybe there? for yeah. him. But like, I mean, culturally, that was also acceptable, right? Like his son did it. And his son was certainly didn't marry somebody who was strong or helped him be successful at all. At all. His yeah. son just wanted the shiny thing. I guess. So. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. I don't know. I think that there was, uh, you know, culturally that is, that was acceptable where like this is once you have a certain amount of success or whatever, it's okay to take another wife. Right. Like you can just, or a mistress, whatever. I guess they're not really married, but. But how much does that suck? Oh yeah. For the first wife. Yeah. I for kind both. Of, like, I mean, as a mistress, that's got to suck too, I would think. But well, the mistress doesn't have to do anything. You that's know, she true. just kind of gets draped with jewels and yeah, but didn't you love but, when the grandfather who lives with them, when he suddenly yes. noticed that the mistress was living there and he'd just say, whore! Like he just <laughs> I know, <would> right? <laughs> and I know it's like not PC to say that, but I was like, oh, finally, someone's <laughs> speaking up. Like, it's, it's like the elephant right. in the room yeah, right. and nobody's addressing the fact that, oh, right. now there's Until this. the old senile man comes yeah. back to reality. He's like, wait a minute. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> What's happening? Whore! <laughs> I loved him so much there. Oh, I yeah. loved him the whole time. He was fun, yeah. actually. Yeah. 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 He just got to ride through mm-hmm. it, didn't he? He just got to kind of let everybody take care of him. 
And, uh, and but then would randomly come up with these comments <laughs> that were like just to like the truth right in front of your face, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah, he was a fun character too. He was fun. And even the little fool, the little fool, I think what oh. that did in the story was make uh, Wang Chung. Okay. <laughs> what, Wang Long? Wang Lang? Wang Long, I yeah. think. I, Sorry. I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, thank you, Wang Long. <laughs> um, it made him so much more human. Yeah. Is when he put her in his little robe. When they were going from their village to the city during the famine, and he really took care of her and loved her, um, even though she was definitely mentally challenged, um, he still loved her, and he didn't trust anybody else to take care of her. The you know, the one day he left someone else in charge of her, they left her outside all night, forgot to bring her in the house, yeah. and that did make him a lot more human. I think that was a very smart choice on the author's part mm -hmm. to give him that one that one connection that was undeniably good you know for him yeah and it was also she was just a reminder of like the reality of i think for those of us who have not lived through a famine <laughs> Um, you know, it's kind of hard to imagine being that hungry and being that sick, like having your body literally, des you know, just destroyed by this hunger. And so this baby who was missing so many nutrients growing up like that, that was that's why she had these special needs, because she just she never developed. Her brain didn't have a chance to mm -hmm. develop um, properly um, because, you know, because she lived through a famine. Yeah. And um so I think that was like a very good reminder of like where they came from and where they could go. And and yeah, totally humanized him that it was like, OK, he's a monster to his wonderful wife, but he's a good person. And all these other people are, ha were just, you know, the idea of having a disabled person was just horrific to them. Like mm -hmm. they people said horrible things about her mm -hmm. and and just to have him like actually caring for her so much and yeah yeah bless her heart yeah. she was happy all the time yeah she was never unhappy the little fool mm -hmm. anyway lace favorite part of the book any part where you're like this sucks or this was not well done or anything? oh i just hated the the um the nephew that yeah, yeah. He was just such a bad yeah, guy. Was, and I know they needed conflict right, in the book, they but him, I just, but he was, anytime yeah. he reared his head, I just thought, oh, that guy. Ugh. <laughs> yeah, I didn't like that guy's mom. Oh, yeah. yeah. That, that, that yeah. whole, that whole family portion of the family. Yeah. yeah. We're gross. The uncle, the aunt. The, yeah. Yeah. They had to have some conflict. Yeah. And it wasn't that bad. I kept thinking some, they're going to get robbed or there's something bad. Yeah. Somebody in the house is going to get raped. Or like it's going to be something really bad is going to happen, but but never did. So maybe that was good because I kept waiting for it, yeah. waiting for it. And it just never. Well, happened. the really bad things that happened were all it was nature. It was famine and floods and locusts, locusts. Yeah, just, it was soldiers all, taking over soldiers. Yeah, I mean, not really yeah, I nature, guess that's but not nature, that's, but yeah, you know. But things beyond their control. Force were, majeure. Like yes. true. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A big yeah. word for you guys. I didn't know I knew that one, did you? Force majeure. Um, all right. Well, what else should we talk about? Yes. Is, are we all just all thumbs it? up. All thumbs up. It for is the all thumbs yeah. up. Right? Yeah. It was good to read a book that was good, isn't it? Yes. Yes. It was right. wonderful. Yes. It's nice to read a fiction that's good. Like there's so many fiction you pick up that you're like, Ugh, I don't care about these people, uh, whatever. It was nice to sit down and read something that was just a good book. Yeah. yeah. It's like eating a delicious pasta dish, right? That mm -hmm. every part of it was excellent. The yes. pasta, the sauce, the protein, the cheese, all of it. Yes, and it was hearty like that. It was yeah. hearty like that. Yeah. It is like a pasta yeah. dish. So how do we find another one of those? <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Isn't that the question? Yeah. How do you find another one like that? Do we just go down the Pulitzer Prize list and read Maybe. all of those? Do you know what? I read this year's Pulitzer Prize winning book and um, by uh, the, Les Années, uh, The Years by Annie Ernaux. And I, I was not, it was not for me. Uh-huh. And it had some similarities to this in that 
it was the span of a lifetime. So it's all of the historical events in a lifetime and how the historical effects, the historical events impacted this main character. But the main character in the years is never, I don't think she's ever named. We just know that she's a female and we see all that happens around her, but Uh, It just, it left me cold Mm. in a way that this one didn't. So as I was reading Mm. this and thinking, oh, wow, it's just a whole bunch of historical events, a famine, a flood, a war, another war, you know, Mm -hmm. all of these things, uh, an uprising, there was the uprising against the rich. Um, And it, it felt very vital in the way that um, that one didn't. I read it and thought, "Uh uh-huh, wow, she's got it all in there. Yep. There's a world Checked transcendent. every box. Yeah. And huh. I just, I didn't feel the way that I did for this mm-hmm. one. So, and that is also Pulitzer Prize winning. So Interesting. She really made these characters human. Like you were really connected to them, whether you loved them, hated them or whatever. Like they were, they were very well rounded. But how did she do that? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Thanks, Gabby. I don't know. You, I don't you know. people are the writers. You do it. I don't but know. How, did you, how do you it do was... that? Well, I have theories on how you do it, but I don't know if it's true. Like, the I think making the characters human is in subtleties, right? Is in little subtleties about how she moves or, um, you know, that that she's in labor and she's still in the field. And she's silent. She doesn't complain. And she does this by herself. Um, when she goes and has babies by herself. Those aren't very, those aren't like huge character, big sweeping, arching choices. They're very simple. Mm-hmm. But when you add them all together, it draws this picture. I don't know. Maybe that's, again, stupid, uh, like ignorant to say that. But I feel like there's so many subtleties in the book that give yeah. you the answer to who they are. You know, without just saying this like is who it's they are, like a little bit of conflict, like not everybody is all good or all bad. Mm-hmm. Right. Like and I think that is the part that makes them far more human. You can relate to them where you're like, OK, so you're kind of a jerk, but then you, you have these characteristics that are actually really quite good, mm-hmm. you know, so I don't know. They just feel more real mm-hmm. that way with both of them. Olan, too. She had some not great characteristics and. She was amazing in so many ways. You yeah, know? probably. Yeah. So, yeah, she did a really good job of making them come mm-hmm. to life. I felt like I was in, I was there. Yeah. I was in the story, in the house that was made of earth, yeah. you know, in the field, in the rice paddy, walking with them to this town. I felt like I was there the whole time. It was a really beautiful book. How do we find another one? <laughs> How do we do that? I have a suggestion for next book club book. But I'm afraid you guys are going to laugh at me. <laughs> <laughs> then do tell. I'm, I'm dying for a laugh because this was right? not a laugh riot. It <laughs> no, was it's not, not a laugh riot. Well, it's a comedy, I guess. Okay. But I think you're going to go, seriously, Leanne? <laughs> so forgive me. And I 100% accept the seriously, Leanne. 100% accept it, right? Okay. Now I feel like I'm we have on to the say edge of my seat. Case. Case. <laughs> okay. Mean. There's a movie coming out this weekend that I am so excited about. I am just about to just explode. I'm going to go see this movie by myself because my daughter has informed me that her dance card is full until Wednesday and I'm not waiting. <laughs> that movie is Are You There, God? I knew it's you were going to say Margaret. that. I knew it. Oh, that's I knew coming it. out. Oh, yes. That's funny. James L. Brooks made it. Yeah. Which let's is do it. insane. So I was like, I haven't read that book since I was in middle school. Like 12? Yeah. It's a middle school book. And I'm like, they're not going to want to read that book. But I want to read read it. It's going to take like a minute and a half to read that book. It's a three hour read. On my Kindle, it says says three three hours. hours. Okay, I'll buy that. So it's a three hour read. Is that enough pages for you? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Uh But I would love to read that book and then watch, also watch the movie. I've read some reviews of the movie and it's getting really good reviews. Oh, yeah? Yeah. It's getting great. I didn't even know that was being made into a movie. I didn't either, but I saw it in, uh, where did I see it? I saw it 
Uh, I, we were streaming something and they, it was, you know, randomly, sometimes those streamers have like a preview yeah. of something that's coming out. And we did. And I, I, I lost my mind. I was like, Tyla, we have to see this movie. It's going to be so awesome. But Jennifer Garner's in it. She plays the uh, Mar- Margaret's mom. Um, and James L. Brooks, he's directed so many amazing films and it just looked good. The trailer, I was like, this looks like it might be really good. So do you want to read Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret? Sure. Okay. I haven't read yeah. that in forever. Me neither. Like, I mean, it's yeah. another Judy Bloom. Yeah. Um, Has and Isla is... ever read it? No. Did your girls read? I you don't know? know. I'm pretty sure my daughter hasn't read it. Isla doesn't read anything she's not forced to read. Okay. So, no. That would Fair be enough. a no. Um, but when I had such a fit about the movie, she was like, oh, well, maybe. Maybe the next time we road trip to the beach, we'll, we'll just put it on because it's three oh, yeah. hours, so an hour up an hour back right. and we'll find another hour going to and from school and we've <gasps> we read should do it next weekend we should make all the girls listen to it in wouldn't the car that be awesome oh my god in the car wouldn't that be funny on the yeah. way up and back not that we'll have all of them but a lot of them and then we could all take them to the to movie go see it. i love this oh my god right that's a great plan <laughs> because it'll be playing up there we all go see oh i love this plan <laughs> look at that and then we can book club about it next week <laughs> <laughs> And then we'll choose another book. <laughs> Since this is the shortest book in history. Well, I mean, that was the one thing I was like, I'll just read this on my own if they don't want to watch it. It's yeah. a three hour read. I mean, uh, three days of taking Isla to school and I've read the book, mm-hmm. you know, not even a day and a half. Yeah, you yeah know. exactly. So, um, OK, well, let's read that book for our next book club and we can turn that around fast. I think yes. we should do that on our Girl Scout trip. That would be really fun, right? I wonder. Yeah. If, yeah. I mean, I guess we we're locking them in a car. We can do whatever we want, <laughs> well, right? We can do subjected to it, right? What we can do before we leave is explain the plan, uh-huh. right? There's this book we all read when we were in middle school. It's coming out as an, in a movie this weekend. We'd like to take you guys to see this movie, but we'd really like to read the book. So we're gonna listen to it for the hour drive up. Yeah, we still have two more hours. To listen to you the know book. what? It's going to be longer than an hour because we're going in Friday traffic. Oh, you're right. So we'll get half. halfway through the book. We'll get halfway yeah. through the book. If we want, we can listen to the other half of the book the next day, go to the yeah. movies that night. I think they'd be into it if it were presented that way. Sure. Let's see. I mean, and of course, that can like, happen. No, we always like to put music on. Let's do they do, on but like all of them listening to it collectively together. That's pretty awesome. Can you hear those conversations? Oh, my God. Yeah, right. It's like priceless. Should we do it with forever instead? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Don't want more to say that. Oh, God. Because Margaret's a, are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. She gets her period mm-hmm. and she's got crushes on boys and it's it's middle school yeah. stuff. It's not forever high school stuff. I, after that, I was like, you know, I still haven't read forever. Maybe I should do that. Maybe I'll download that for the summer when I have some downtime. And I'm like, Girl, you you ain't reading a book. I know that's not what you're doing in your downtime. So, but that might be fun. All right, middle school middle school fiction <laughs> now called YA. It right? may not quite actually be Pulitzer Prize, <laughs> but that's okay. Moving on. But a generation of girls read that book. Absolutely, everybody our age yeah. read that book. Everybody. I don't know anybody my age that didn't read. Are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. Do you? No. Everybody. No, I mean, everybody, read, yeah. Maybe not everybody read forever, but everybody I didn't read, read that, that book. But yeah. I think, it, I wonder if it was like a handbook for, hey, you're, you're getting your period. I don't have to talk to you about it. Read this book. <laughs> you know? It's possible. I don't know. You ever yeah. been reading anything else behind my back? I've been, <laughs> I've been reading Secretly, a lot. Secretly, I've not uh, read anything. What you been reading? Between our last two book clubs, I don't think I've read anything. I've been listening. Uh, I don't know why I did this, but I started listening to a book while I was reading this book because I really wanted to physically read this Mm -hmm. book. But I was running out of time and ended up listening to the last part of it. And the guy who narrated the book was amazing. This book? Yes. Oh, yeah. So I bought this book on Kindle after the book was stolen in my luggage. (laughs) So I had a hard copy copy book. And then when our luggage was stolen in San Francisco, the book was in my luggage. So I was like, I I don't have time to get another book. I'm just going to download it on my Kindle. And the Kindle comes with a narration piece for this particular, not all books do on Kindle, but this one does. So I listened to the narration for the last couple days to finish it up. And that guy, so anybody listening, if you buy it on your Kindle, 
you can listen to it and you can toggle back and forth from reading it on your Kindle and listening to it. It, it keeps you at the same page. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, that's fantastic. Right. So Audible doesn't do that. But Kindle does it. But not all books for Kindle offer that feature. So you just have to kind of, you know, hope, hope. for the best. Yeah. But this had it and, and it was wonderful. So I finished it like that. But I just listened to um, Mel Brooks memoir. It oh, was yeah. so fun. He read it. And it was so fun. He talks about his childhood and um, being in the army. And he worked in the like uh, dirty dancing type summer camps as an entertainer and that and how he his chops from the summer camp helped him in the army and how his chops from the army helped him on the Sid Caesar show. And he kind of just wove everything together. And then at when he starts making films, each chapter is about each film he made and how that film came about. Mm -hmm. And, um, well, I mean, to be honest with you, it was all positive. There was just nothing negative in that book. And I'm sure there were negative things that happened, but that man said nothing negative about anything that happened to him other than his wife Anne Bancroft getting cancer and dying. And it was maybe two sentences of the negativity. He only talked about the positive things. It was very, um, very cool to read because I'm a huge Mel Brooks fan and I've watched all his movies and that it was really fun. Um, so, but that was just like, you know, that was like eating a lollipop. It was just <laughs> sugar. It was something I put on in the car and George has watched quite a few Mel Brooks friend films with me too. So we were listening to it together on the drive. She wouldn't have been interested to, in the good earth. I tried to do that with her, put books on. We started listening to Are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret, but we got really distracted. <laughs> we were distracted by something else. What what have you been reading? Um, oh, I read a book that I think you would probably both really like. The Other Family Doctor, a veterinarian explores what animals can teach us about love, life, and mortality by Karen Fine. It's a memoir about her journey as a veterinarian. Mm. And um, it's very interesting um, I learned that vet school is essentially med school, yeah. that, that they actually take a lot of classes with med school students. And when she, she, I, I'm assuming that she's about our age or maybe a little younger, but she talked about being in med school and the, the med students would moo at the vet students. <laughs> and um, she talks about how um, with vets there, it's one of the highest rates of suicide in the world uh, it, um, as a profession. And why? I, I was so intrigued. I'd heard that about I'd dentists. Heard that. Um, oh, dentists? Mm -hmm. Because if you think about it, everybody's stressed when they come to see you and you're causing pain More stress and like pain mm -hmm. and stress. Um, so, um, yes. So the reason is so they're, they have all of the, the study, all of the, um, all the years of education that uh, a med student has, it's actually harder to get into vet school because there are fewer veterinarian schools. So um, it's very high, high. You have to be a super, super, super high achiever. So all the stress that comes with that. Then when you are finally a vet, when you think about it, like it's the most, a lot of people don't have um, insurance for their pets. And so they're dealing with a lot of people who come and they're have to, are like, well, I can't afford this life-saving treatment for my animal. And so you have to put them down. And just knowing that you could do more for this animal, but they can't pay. And then the alternative is like a lot of vets are in extreme debt because they have huge hearts and they just want to save as many animals. And so then they just don't get paid for their work in the way that a doctor is going to get paid from right. insurance mm -hmm. or from, you know, yeah. um, there's more of a system for that, but also it's like people, um, you know, prioritize, we prioritize human health. So you're not going to not pay your cardiologist bill. Yeah. You know what I mean? But like your vet, it's like people arguing about why is it so expensive? Yeah. Why, yeah. Oh, why do we have to get this expensive food? Why do we have to do this? Why do we have to whatever? And, um, yeah, but it was very interesting. And so, and just, and then the, just the cost, the emotional cost of dealing with people putting their beloved animals to sleep, like yeah. losing their friends, mm -hmm. like, or whether they're putting them to sleep or whether the animal just dies, but just 
constantly day in, day out, dealing with people sobbing and Aww. just destroyed. And people are destroyed by their animals' deaths in a way that they sometimes aren't about humans. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because they're just, it's such a pure love. Mm -hmm. Um so um, it was very, very interesting to learn about that. It was very, I cried a lot you <laughs> reading did. it. Yeah, but it was it was very beautifully written. And um, yes, yeah, so I recommend that by Karen Fine. And then I read All the Beauty in the World, the Metropolitan Museum of Art and Me by Patrick, Patrick Bringley, which is also a memoir. And um, his brother um, dies of cancer. Um, they're both in their 20s. And he decide, he's working um, at The New Yorker and he decides he wants to get a job where he can just leave at the end of the day, that there's not homework or whatever. So he gets a job as a museum guard at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And he's a, he's a museum guard for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And he it's just it, the life of being an observer about standing, like your job mm -hmm. is to stand and keep the peace. And um, but then, so there's not a lot about his grief, but basically it's about 10 years of grief and then all that happens in his life. And, you know, it's not, it, there's not a lot of focus on the grief, but that is the theme. That's mm -hmm. the arc mm -hmm. of it is, is him, um, experiencing grief, but the focus is on being in a place with all the beauty in the world. So he describes paintings and he describes sculptures and he describes interactions with people experiencing all of this beauty. And some of it is funny people saying like, well, where's the Mona Lisa? And he's like, that's not here. <laughs> They're like, Well, don't you have a copy of it? <laughs> no, these aren't copies. This is actual. You know? Right. And, but then also just like the beautiful things like that he learned more about art from people who know nothing about art because they're bringing such a fresh, mm -hmm. like fresh eyes and just such a honest, vulnerable um, interpretation. And um, I learned a lot about art from reading that book and I, it made me care about art more than I enjoy a museum and as much as the average person, which is to say that I'm not like, oh, get me to all the museums all the time. But I do like to occasionally stroll through and see all the beauty in the world. And it really... Um, it gave me more of an appreciation. Mm. Um, and it was really quite, I think it was just really quite beautiful the way he wove it all together where it wasn't really, you kind of forgot that it was about grief, but then you didn't like right. it was, there was very little said about it. And yet sort of in the way that Wang Lung um, didn't say a lot about Olan, but we knew that he was thinking about her and we yeah. knew that her death mm -hmm. affected him. It was, a very, you know, similar sort of um, meditation on grief. And I really, really liked it. That's cool. Well, yeah, cool. That's cool. Very cool. <laughs> mm -hmm. Not reading anything, Kathy? What mm -hmm. have you been doing with your life? I mean, seriously. <laughs> I mean, Besides, isn't that the question? <laughs> I do hear Plumbing. you baked a lot for my daughter. Oh my gosh, she was so funny yesterday. This is the first time that actually every package got delivered in two days. I was like, it's taken a whole freaking year. And I finally figured out how to like package things and get them there. Like everything has been, you know, I ship it like two day mail, right? Yeah. But it has never gotten there. I got like four phone calls yesterday. I was like, oh my God, it worked finally. Hey, like, yeah. So good. Oh. I'm glad she liked it. Oh, yes. I should show you the text thread that happened. Because we have our family, the four of us, has a text thread called Baby Walrus. Mm -hmm. And she dinged Baby Walrus, look what I got. And then just a picture of the box. And Isla was like, all caps, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> and then everything's misspelled. Because, you know, Isla, where well, you have to like, you need like one of those like interpreter <laughs> window things to understand you what have to the say hell it out, she's You know what talking. I found? Like if you speak it out loud, yeah. you're like, you can sort of understand what her, what she's yes, trying to say. Because she's spelling phonetically. Yes. And she. Or she's talking a text and like, you can just, I don't know, the flow of it works better. Like She you doesn't can, talk to text. Oh, she doesn't? No, well, she does not. It she spells it all phonetically. Like she does. Is not what's <laughs> happening. Most, and sometimes it'll autocorrect what she's doing uh -huh. and it'll put a totally different word in there because she doesn't know how to spell the word right so yeah but i have to let me see where's my phone it was hysterical <laughs> i'm just gonna share it with you now because i was laughing see all caps can you see from there all caps <laughs> she says um she just sent the picture uh oh bert says i miss you guys 
And Georgia says, no, you don't. And then the picture of your box. <laughs> and then she says, Kathy does. Kathy wins. So <laughs> yummy. This is Isla, all caps. What? New text. No. New text. <laughs> that is unfay. <laughs> F-A-I-E. That is so unfay. <laughs> You wanner her bakeries. <laughs> you wanner, W-A-N-R, her bakery is spelled B-A-K-O-R-Y. <laughs> bakery. <laughs> and then I told you, she was very, she was very impassioned when she was writing this. Maybe exactly. that's why. And then Georgie goes, <laughs> and Isla says, die with a period. Die, period. <laughs> And Georgia says, I want her heart times three. Mwah, perfection. Uh, um, these are really sweet. And I kind of goes, wrong. <laughs> Georgia says, right. Uh, and then I goes, mom and my mind boxes are the best. We give you material, M-I-T-I-R-E-A-L, material fibbigs. <laughs> Material thibbings, not just food, period. <laughs> and Georgia just says, made from the heart. And Isla says, wrong. She made it from sperm. <laughs> it is not holy. Throw it away. <laughs> and Georgia says, so holy. Loving it. <laughs> she made it from sperm. <laughs> it's definitely how it was made. Yes. This is that pipe layer, I'm telling you. No, yes. I mean, she's so funny. Yeah, she funny. was so mad. I'm surprised she didn't. Uh, I did not get a text from her. So shocked you didn't hear from Milo about yeah. that. <laughs> shocked. It was bad. <laughs> Today's wife of the party is sponsored by Lumi. Lumi is a pro uh, shit. Booty B.O. sounds funny. Having it is not so funny. That's why I'm so excited to tell you about Lumi. It's the world's best whole body deodorant. It's clinically proven to control odor everywhere. Pits, privates, and beyond for 72 hours. Now, let me tell you. I took 13 Girl Scouts camping. They all 13 are in high school. Can you say booty odor? Can you say smelly? I mean, it's pretty bad. So what did I pack? I packed some Lumi deodorant wipes. Best call, best thing I've ever done. Because a stinky teenager comes in, they each take a wipe, they wipe themselves down, pits, privates, wherever is smelly, and we're set for 72 hours. It's pretty freaking awesome. An OBGYN uh, founded Lumi, Dr. Shannon Klingman, and she met thousands of women concerned with odor below the belt. Through clinical testing, she discovered it wasn't the vagina to blame, but bacteria on the skin. So she created Lumi, which is a pH-optimized, aluminum-free deodorant that actually works and works everywhere, with over 150,000 five-star reviews to prove it. Lumi Starter Pack is perfect for new customers. It comes with a solid stick deodorant, cream tube deodorant, two free products of your choice, like a mini body wash and a deodorant wipes, and free shipping. As a special offer for listeners, new customers get $5 off a Lumi Starter Pack with code WIFE30 at lumideodorant.com. That's spelled L-U-M-E deodorant.com that equates to over 40 percent off your starter pack when you visit lumideodorant.com and use code wife 30 so what do you guys send and how often do you send it i send a monthly box i send it to georgia max and three of georgia's friends um and i have uh one of our credit cards uh, has reward points where you can cash it in for travel or you can cash it in for gift cards. So I cash in my reward points to get all different kinds of gift cards like Pizza Hut and Bed Bath & Beyond and Amazon and Starbucks and Domino's Pizza and Cold Stone. I mean, there's a ton. There's probably 50 different options for gift cards. So I just go in and cash those in. And then I send the kids one to three gift cards and then depending on the season or what's happening, you know, like Halloween, I send Halloween stuff and Thanksgiving, I send Thanksgiving stuff. And like fe February, I spent Valentine's Day stuff and I sent a little bit of Easter stuff in March, even though Easter is in April. 
and I haven't gotten April together. So that's kind of what I do. I've sent them stuff. The one that I heard the most from, and I may not have sent exactly this to Max because Max has allergies and I'm not sure what to send him. So I just don't send him Mm -hmm. if I'm not sure was I sent in December, the first week of December, because I knew they were getting out of school really soon. I sent them a a sick box. So like um, Mucinex, Kleenex, hand sanitizer, throat lozenges, cup noodle, um, uh, like fuzzy socks, um, stuff like that. Like so, and every single person that called me, which was not Max Fromkin, <laughs> every single person who called or texted me was like, I needed this so badly. My roommate was sick or my best friend here was mm. sick or I was sick. You have no idea how awesome that was. And the the uh, most of the gift cards I send are for food. Because I know they get so tired of eating mm-hmm. off the pass and they can, Domino's will deliver, you know? Yeah. So the, what's been most impactful, what I'm hearing back from them is the food gift cards. So, you know, to be able to order from Chipotle and have it delivered mm-hmm. on a Postmate is like, fuck, they're like, yeah, that's amazing. It's like heaven. Yeah. A choice. Yep. And then not have to go to the dining hall. So mainly when I send them gift cards, it's almost always some kind of food. Um, every once in a while I'll throw in a target card or something just to kind of mix it up. But that's what I've been doing. And, you know, I have Isla help me and we literally just go to Rite Aid. We're not going, I'm not buying shit at some fancy place. We go to Rite Aid and just walk the aisles and go, huh, this looks like something they could probably use. You know, one time I sent them all a mini first aid kit because you think you move in, you don't think about some of this stuff. I just tried to be thoughtful of what was happening in the moment and that what, what they might, might be needing. You know, a couple, couple months into college, I think I sent them some basic, stupid, goofy school supplies. Like I sent Max mm-hmm. some post-it notes and like every single post-it note was like, fuck, or <laughs> are you fucking kidding me? Or kiss my ass or whatever. I don't remember exactly what it was, <laughs> right. but it was a funny like post-it note because I thought, He'll think that's funny. <laughs> and I bet you he might need a post-it note from time to time. <laughs> and so I did, that's what I do. That's what do you great. do? I'm taking notes on Minus all, I'm all notes. food. Mine is I just have like one day where I bake like five or six different things. And then I divide it up into the like four or five different boxes and then mail it out. Um, so it's all food. And then like it's always like. A letter. Uh, like a little handwritten note. Like, Me too. Good luck on finals or you know, happy Valentine's day or like whatever it is. Yeah. Um, but I've had a lot, I had a lot of issues because my stuff is homemade. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm like, I've got to get it out on Monday because if I get it out on Thursday, it doesn't get delivered until Saturday. Post offices aren't open on Saturday or kids don't get it. So then it's sitting there. So like I had, it took me a while to get into the flow of getting it. And sometimes like Georgia, like one of the times I sent it, it was like five days later. Right. And mm. I was like, oh my God, this stuff is like freaking stale at this point. You yeah. know what I mean? So it just, yeah. Food is big. So mine was not every month. That was the plan, but it didn't work out that way. But this yeah, April's the first is... month I have missed. First this month. is the first month I got it right. Where I was like, boom, oh my God, it was mailed out on Monday. Everybody got it in two days. I was like, yes, that's how that's it works. Fantastic. That's what's supposed to happen. Yeah, so. I got to get mine for April out. Um, I was like, they're all coming home. I know, right? Like in a heart, like next week. Yeah, well, two mine's weeks. not. Mine's not coming out in the middle, middle of June. Mine's coming home in two weeks. That's crazy. Yeah. For the summer? Yeah. Wow. He's done. He's coming home on the 4th. Wow. So I'm like, shit. That is crazy coming up yeah Um, crazy right they finished their first year of college like that is mind-blowing yeah it is to me yeah georgia was just home uh for family feud and um yeah i can't believe it's i'm like wow it's already over but back to what you're saying about what they want Mm -hmm. so when georgia was here for family feud home state is a is a taco place here on ventura boulevard i don't know if you've ever eaten there there's a couple Mm -hmm. other ones there's one in silver lake it's so good. They make their tortillas homemade. Mm. And a lot of their um, tacos, my mouth just watered. <laughs> it's so good. A lot of their tacos are like breakfast taco based. 
Um, so there's a lot of eggs in them, but every single taco I've ever had are so good. Mm -hmm. So we got home from Family Feud and I was like, let's have home steak tacos. And Bert went bananas. Uh, for four people, he ordered like 20 tacos, <laughs> not joking. And they're like, one taco's all I can eat. They're kind of burrito tacos. They're not mm -hmm. really a taco. They're like big, hearty. <laughs> and then he said, well, I ordered them so you could take them back to school with you because she was flying out the next morning. And I was like, what a great idea. So yeah. I got, you know, the plastic Gladware or whatever and just lined it. I think she took like 16 tacos home mm -hmm. and then did another one with tortilla chips and salsa. And she texted me and went, Mom, word got out. Yeah. Everybody showed up to my dorm, and one of my friends took two tacos and went under my bed, bed and hid <laughs> and ate them and started crying <laughs> because they were so good. <laughs> and I was like, what? She said she's so tired of eating on this yeah. meal plan that she was crying because this was like actual food, Mom. <laughs> it's actual food. I sent her home with eight biscuits. They were gone first day. Um, it's so all about the food. It's all about. And that's all I ever hear. Mom, when are you sending me more snacks? When are you sending more snacks? Like, uh, like, yeah, it is all about the food. Yeah. Gift cards for food or yeah. like actual food. Like, even if it's like, like I send him a box of Girl Scout cookies. You know what I mean? I sent a whole bunch of those. He took the some back when he went after spring break. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like they just want food. Yeah, they do. They just want <laughs> they variety. They might be starving. Yeah. Yeah, they just they get tired of what's yeah. being served up downstairs in yeah. their in their dining hall. They're just sick of it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, food number one. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> it's been fun too because we yeah. I do the gift cards and then and the gift cards don't cost me anything per se. You know they cost me points, but it's you know that one credit card we have all our monthly bills on, so it's not like it's you know one million frequent flyer miles. It's just like. I like doing that. I like uh -huh. redeeming them for a card. I didn't want to do something else with that card. So, but when we go to Rite Aid, it was all about the snack first. Yeah. And Daisy, who has been on this podcast before, every time she'll go like, you have no idea. I was starving. <laughs> and I opened the box and every bit of food was gone before I even got back to my dorm room. <laughs> I was starving. Oh, Georgia. Georgia. When she came home for Family Feud, she brought a huge duffel bag full of, like, deep winter clothes that she's done with up there. So just to save her having to bring it back another time, she brought home a huge bag that she was bringing back relatively empty. So she literally went in my pantry. She took yeah. the tacos, the tortilla chips, shook the biscuits. I had a huge case of ramen. She took the whole case of ramen. <laughs> it's a huge case of this, like... It's a Costco case yeah. of ramen. She took the whole thing in her duffel bag. She just kept putting <laughs> food in her duffel bag. <laughs> so, yeah, it's the food. I forgot about yeah. that. I was like, everything in your duffel bag is food. And she was like, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. I have one pair of shoes and a sweatshirt, <laughs> and the rest of it is food. Isn't that yeah. funny? I did the same thing, though. Did you do that when you yeah. went back home from I was, college? Oh, it was all about food. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, remember my mom sending me food care packages. Same thing. Yeah. No one sent me care packages, but I was in driving distance from my grandmother's house. So I would show up on Sunday morning because at lunch after church every Sunday, she had like a spread <laughs> and I would eat the spread and I would pack it up and I'd drive it back home every Sunday. I was like, yep, I'll be getting that food. And even when I lived in New York and flew home for visits, I flew back with a ton of food. Yeah. Because you just, you know. It's just not the same. It's not the it's same. It's not the same. You know, and Max goes to Trader Joe's every week. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like they go shopping, but it's not the same. There's something different when somebody sends it to you. Even if it's like the Trader Joe's shit that I buy and I stick in a box for him and send it. Like it's somehow different. Right. So. It is. Yeah. Yeah. It's been really fun. I don't know. I've had a blast doing uh -huh. that. Because she picks out what everybody gets and... um we try to make it funny. Like I sent the girls. What's that? When she sent her school picture. Yes. She sent everyone a, a, her school picture <laughs> so they could have it. And what's really funny, I don't think he Max said something yeah. like, I think that you mistakenly <laughs> dropped Isla's school picture in my box. And I went, no, I think Isla put it in your box. And he was like, for real? I said, yeah. 
Yes. She did it to everybody. <laughs> and so everyone has sent a picture of where they have Isla in their dorm room. Yeah. But she That's thought funny. it's just amazing, you know. So it's been really fun. It's mm-hmm. been one way of keeping us connected. And Georgia, so many times, probably three times this year has texted me and said, you have no idea what that means to me. When I go to the mailbox and I have a package from you and I know that you and Isla did it together and it just makes me feel like you, you're you thinking about me, oh. even when I'm not home, that I'm not forgotten. And it means a lot to me. Thank you so much. She was like, even more than what you put in the box. It's just that you do it. And she said, it makes me feel really good that you do it for all my friends, too. So I'm not, I don't know, but I don't think her friends' moms have been doing that. I know a couple of her friends' moms definitely are not doing that or not sending anything. Which, do you need to send anything? No, you don't have to. But I really want to. I've really yeah. enjoyed it. Even with Max, it's super stuff, fun. It is really yeah. fun because then at some of the stuff I send him, I go, I bet he doesn't even know that I know that he likes this, uh-huh. right? Like you told me he likes Oreos, but there was something else I put in his box, and I like went, you know, he loves those things, don't you? I don't even remember what it was, and I said, yeah, I actually, I somehow I do. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> he's like my nephew, so it'd be a shame if I didn't know anything, <laughs> you know. So anyway, that's, that's awesome. Really fun, yeah, it is fun. So she she's not ready to grow up. You're a college age, almost college age girl. Uh, I'm clear. <laughs> she's still feeling like going to school. She still away. hasn't decided, and decision day is in like a Couple little over weeks. a week. Though. Oh, right, it's like May first, right? May first. Yeah. So that's just a little over a week away. And um, is she down to two? Or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, is down to two. Um, one is in California, and one is very far away. It's across the country and then a drive. (laughs) So it's, um, and that is her favorite place, the far away one, but she's just having second thoughts about whether or not that Mm -hmm. is too far for her. And we're trying to tell her it's okay to not go to your favorite place. Like it's okay to know your limitations right now you could go there for grad school you could you know who knows what will happen in life like you you can have the rest of your life to live far away to live on the east coast um but at the same time yeah i don't know what's gonna happen it's a tough choice right it is a tough choice but i think what happens it's always possible that your second choice could then be your favorite place you know it's possible. It doesn't happen for everybody. Sometimes your first choice you hate. You know, you yeah. think it's amazing and you get there and go, I'm not staying here. You know, there are a couple of friends of George's at college um, have made that realization. Like, this is not for me. And where they're in school was their number one choice. Mm-hmm. It just just happens, you know. Yeah, you know, that happens way more frequently than we ever hear about. Totally. You know? It does. Yes. And the California mm-hmm. place was... Um, was the first choice when she toured it. She toured it before the other places and fell in love, loved it. And then um, fell in love with the idea of living across the country. And so I'm trying to tell her, you love both of these places. Yeah, They're both beautiful. They both have great academic opportunities for you, but also really fun things great food we sampled in the dining, the dining <laughs> hall and all of the places that we went to so yeah uh, it's just I think it's also just that feeling of it's the first big choice yeah. that any mm-hmm. of them ever have yeah, yeah. and um the risk you know the weight of making a big decision is uh, is huge and yeah it feels huge Totally. I know that. I mean, most years for my birthday, I just tell Richard, he says, where do you want to eat? And I'm like, what I want for my birthday is to not make a decision. Yeah. Like right. make a decision for me. I don't care. That's the gift. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and uh, so I understand. I do relate to that feeling of just like, it's too big a decision. Yeah. I don't, somebody tell me what to do. <laughs> right. I hear you. It is a big yeah. decision. I was, t- who was I talking to the other day? I was like, you know, I think I filled out my college application in March. And then went to school in September and it was really, I didn't look at a college. I didn't even like for me, at least for my environment, you either went to West Georgia college, which is now university of West Georgia, or you went to Georgia tech. If you wanted to be an engineer or you went to the university of Georgia, 
nobody looked anywhere else. Nobody looked out of state. And I was like, well, I'm not going to Athens. It's, it's too far away. I'm not going to school for engineering at Georgia Tech. So I'm going to West Georgia because I don't know what I want to do. So why would I go all the way to Athens, you know, three and a half hours away, and when I don't even know why I would be going there? So I just need to go to college. So I'll just sign up for West Georgia and see where life leads me, sort of. And I feel like one, maybe one kid in our class went to Georgia Tech. One kid went to University of Georgia. And the rest of us went to West Georgia. Um, and it's just so simple. You know, you didn't need to be at some other huge place to learn to get an undergrad. Or at least that was the philosophy. You just needed to get to go to college. And now it's just so complicated. And and for what reason? You know, for what reason? Why? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't it's know a lot. <laughs> it is a lot. What do you think Max is going to say about his first year? Uh, and what, what do you mean? Like, like, woo, or, uh, oh, no, no, <laughs> <laughs> there's no woo. <laughs> like, uh, what do you think he will have, well, he will say he has learned from this first year? He, well, that's interesting. What, I don't know what he will say he has learned. Okay. Probably nothing. So, but okay. We all know that's inaccurate. Yeah. Um, he's learned a ton, both academically and emotionally and like growing as a 18 year old. Um, he's definitely learned a ton. It's been really, really good for him, even though it has not been the smoothest of years. It has not been the happiest of years for him. Um, it was, it really needed to happen. Mm. So, um, I don't know. So if he can, if he had to answer the question and the answer could not be nothing, mm -hmm. what do you think he would say he learned? Because, you know, he'd say nothing and then you'd ask him and really ask him, get him to really figure it out. What do you think he would say? Um, I, I would hope, I would think he would say, um, I have learned how to live with the challenging roommate. Okay. I have learned how to deal with things that are not what I had envisioned mm -hmm. initially going in. Um, and then I think there's definitely some academic stuff that he said he has learned. Right. Like he's learned a lot about, um, how to be a different kind of student. Not that he's necessarily done that, but um, figuring out how to make the jump from high school to college. Mm -hmm. He's definitely learned about that. Um, and then he's just learned stuff in general. Like there are some classes where he's like, oh yeah, like where he'll just talk your ear off about things that he's learned and other classes that he has just been like, huh. <laughs> Who cares? He texted us yesterday and was like on our family thing. He's like, this is the last time you'll ever hear me complain about English again. <laughs> and Stephen was like, OK, you just had your last English class. He's like, yes. And then he's like, but don't you still have one more paper to turn in? Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> no more English ever. Uh, <laughs> like his like nemesis is English classes or English teachers for whatever reason. Uh, if um, only Max and Camille could go to college together. <laughs> and, like, they would never be in the same class ever. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? If he, she would do all the English, he would do all, all of the math. science and math. Yeah. yeah. That's it's a dream. Funny. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's good. That sounds like it was really good, valuable. If he There's a lot of value that came out of it. I don't know. He tends to be, you know, very glass half full, kind of glass half empty. Uh -huh. Sorry, I always get that backwards. Um, he's, you know, more negative than I would like. <laughs> so he tends to uh, focus on that kind of stuff as opposed to the more positive stuff, but there has been a lot of positive, um, even though, like I said, it was not the smoothest of years. But. Right. Would you say he approaches adversity or uncomfortableness, like kicking and screaming, like, I don't want to do it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, some people do some Bert's that way. I mean, if he knows some big change is happening, he's going to go through it at the top of his lungs. Mm -hmm. Whereas I, I'm not like that. Yeah. Um, and, and there's nothing wrong with either one. I think it's interesting to know about yourself how you handle change, you know, mm -hmm. so that you can say, oh, 
I am feeling all of these feelings because I'm in the middle of a change. And that's, that's how I, how I handle change, you know, not to even judge yourself on that. Still working on learning that part. (laughs) Yeah. Well, well, of course he's too young to know that part. He's way too young to learn that part. I mean, was talking to somebody yesterday about how, Oh, I don't remember now about how, um, how you approach, um, handling your mental health and when you're in your 20s it's so scary and overwhelming if you are feeling depressed or a lot of anxiety or a lot of stress you know what I mean if you're heartbroken if you've had a if you got fired from your job you know those aren't mental health those a couple of those aren't mental health per se but they actually are they put you I think in a mental health crisis moment mm-hmm. not suicidal crisis but just like where you can't not focus on the boy who broke up with you. And now you can't even like get out of the bed because you can't get over this heartbreak. Right. And how, as you grow older, you would hope that with maturity, you kind of not welcome those moments, but understand the moments and know that the other side of that Mm -hmm. moment is positive. Right. So even if you lost your job, And you're this age and it's scary and you're embarrassed and you're lost and confused. You've done it enough times or you've done something like that, had a loss in some way enough times that you understand that something's on the other side of it. This may be happened for a reason. Let's figure out what our next path is. And you can manage those feelings a little better. Um, That's what I I hope my kids um, get from me is that. These feelings they're having are there is how they learn how to be that when they're an adult. You know, mm-hmm. when you have those feelings of this is terrible, the glass half empty feelings, if you allow them to, they can inform you about how you process the world so that those feelings, when they come back, you recognize them and go, OK, I know what this is. And I know on the other mm-hmm. side of that, I'm going to be fine instead of I think. Not, I'm not talking about Max specifically, but I think some kids get stuck in that model of everything's a catastrophe, meaning my husband <laughs> gets stuck in the everything's a catastrophe when you're like, everything's actually not a catastrophe. You have to have a little reflection to go, well, look what you, all, all these catastrophes you've lived through and you've been fine. Apply that. Right. To the moment when you're back in a catastrophe. No, you, you got through all this. It's going to be okay. <laughs> you know, that's what they're doing now. Yeah. That's what all your 20s is about, right? Is learning. Hopefully. You're losing your first job, losing your first love, sometimes a teenager, but also your 20s, you know, um, failing a class for some people, you know, dropping a class. Dropping class was always so hard for me because I was like, I'm admitting I can't handle it. Mm -hmm. Um, That one thing was so stressful in college. Could you imagine now? I'd be like, I'm totally fucking dropping that class. (laughs) You know, (laughs) drop it like it's hot. I'm not doing it. Learning to walk away from things that you've changed your mind on, like learning that it's okay to change your mind. Uh I remember being in my 20s and because I have said I'm interested in this, that I, then if I wasn't enjoying it anymore, I felt like I didn't have the agency to walk away from that. Mm -hmm. And then learning that, oh no, you can, you can change your mind a hundred times, a million times. Totally. I wonder why we are taught that somehow culturally, that once you make a choice, that's your choice, you know, instead of saying, why, why does that have to be the way, you know, Max may graduate from school and be an engineer for five years and go, you know what? I want to be a music teacher. Why is that a, a problem? I mean, I'm not saying for no, you no, no, in I totally general, agree. Yeah. in yeah. life, it, but we do in our 20s go, I can't do that. You know, I just went to college for that. I can't do that. <laughs> right. I got to stay on this path and just <laughs> myself through life. And it's just not necessary. The 20s are an amazing opportunity to learn how you learn, right? How do I learn? And then as you learn how you learn, you learn faster and more efficiently and easier as you get older, right? Mm -hmm. That's what I've told Georgia and her friends anyway, is that this is what college is. The learning is not the book learning. It's the learning how you learn. How do you learn to take care of yourself in the world? And what does that, how does that affect you? What do you react to? And then ask yourself, why do I react to that the way that I do? And it'll help you figure out 
how to make your how to make your life easier, you know? Anyway, <laughs> we are reading Are You There, God is Me, Margaret, right? Yes. We are forcing our Girl Scout troop to read it. <laughs> There's not a badge for this, but they will be reading it by proxy. <laughs> And then we'll take them to the movies. One day we should have the whole troop in here to just talk about Girl Scouts. <laughs> oh, my God. The chaos. Oh, that would be, like, be so funny. Hurting cats it at the best be of times. But... <laughs> it would be funny. It would be great. You know what's interesting about our little troop right now is I know um, uh, we have a lot of moms. We've re- several moms who've reached out saying, hey, my daughter's struggling in school. For a lot of different reasons, for social reasons, uh, pressured for college, um, lots of different reasons. Um, And it's not always who you think, is it? Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's always who our kids think, because Isla heard, I guess Isla heard us talking about this a little bit, maybe at your house, right? And of course, she spent the whole weekend going, who was it? Was it Molly? Was it Zoe? Uh Was it Zoe? Was it Charlotte? Well, I told you. Who was it? And but she kept trying, and there was pieces where we wouldn't tell her yeah. everything that we didn't tell her who was talking about no. who. We, didn't, we kept it all to of ourselves. Not. Yeah. But the people she was guessing when I was, I would, I would give her no information about anybody. Yeah. She would unwind why that person was having trouble in her brain, <laughs> why she thought that was the person whose mom had said they're having trouble. Right. And sometimes she was right, and sometimes she it. We weren't privy to that person, but the unraveling she was doing, I went, I wonder if that's happening and we don't know. Right. You know, if Isla knows. Such an interesting time well, period, isn't it? Well, you know, I told you that when you were not here at the beginning, I had started the conversation by saying, listen, we have heard from your parents that you girls or that several people are struggling, right? And literally everyone at that table was like, oh my God, that was my mom. Like literally uh, yeah. everyone was like, oh yeah, my mom ratted me out. And I was like looking around. And it was around. none of their moms. It was literally <laughs> it was none of their not moms. one person who was sitting there. And I was like, wow. So how powerful is it that like we have heard from some moms about girls who are struggling and yet all of the girls who we haven't heard from are like, oh no, no, it's me, it's me. I'm definitely struggling too. So what is going on with our girls? What is yeah. going on with being a teenager these days? Like that's it, it's being a teenager. It is it, but uh-huh. it kills me. Yeah, it's really hard. These girls are uh, so strong and powerful and amazing humans. And yet every one of them is feeling not like that. I hate that. Yeah, I agree. They're yes. all so great. Oh, my God. Yeah. There's not a bad apple in that bunch. No. They're great girls. And they have such different personalities and, like, unique abilities and strengths and whatnot. Like, ah, uh, I wish they could see that. Mm-hmm. I wish they could see what we see. Why don't they see it? I don't know. Is it social media? Is it the mm-hmm. fast girls around that make them feel less than? And, uh, hey, by the way, being a fast girl is not bad. If that's who you are then you should be that. I have no problem with a kid being a fast girl. But as long as that kid isn't actively making someone feel bad about it. But sometimes when, I know for me, sometimes even today, when I'm with somebody who's got their shit together and they're fashionable and they're fabulous and they're everything, I start going, I suck. And I actually know I don't. But when you're with someone who just is so outwardly amazing, it does affect you sometimes where you go, wow, yeah, maybe should have put some makeup on today. <laughs> maybe shouldn't have worn my Stan Smiths again. <laughs> maybe, you know what I mean? We can't help but compare ourselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, even at 50, almost three, um, I still do that. So I wonder if it, I don't know. I hate it yeah. for them. So- but I also think people don't have a very good perspective on who they are you know, or how they present in the world necessarily. And especially not when you're teenagers. Yeah. You know, like as an adult, we've learned who we are. And I mean, somewhat. (laughs) I don't remember. I mean, do you remember being really insecure like that in high school? Hell yeah. Oh, I was not. Oh, I was. Oh, I was not. Okay. Oh my God. I was taller than everybody. I was like, oh God. Yeah. No, I absolutely remember feeling that way okay i did not want anyone to see me ever what at all yeah oh <laughs> kathy 
I'm fine. I mean, I'm I know here. But right? that breaks my heart for little fine. Kathy. But you know what I mean? Like, I, t- I get that as almost like a developmental mm-hmm. kind of thing mm-hmm. where like that struggle with or without the social media, with or without all of the other shit that they experienced that we didn't. I don't know how different it would really be. Mm. Yeah, because also the things that the girls are struggling with, it's not necessarily that. It may be that for some of them. But there's also, there's just the expectations. Like there's so many of them are just such high achievers. And there's such a grind. There's no end to that. I have a friend who went to Yale Law School who said, oh, I would never, if I had kids, I'd never let them apply here. And I said, why? Was it horrible? And she said, the the level that you have to be at to get into that program is so just the, ab, they're absolutely relentless, like, and the, the level of competition against one another and against themselves. She said, it's just a breeding ground. If you don't have anxiety going in, you're going to get it, Wow. <laughs> you know, by the time you're out. Mm-hmm. And um, she said, yeah, I would never do that. So I just, I think that like the expectations now um, and just, you know, getting into a good college and, you know, all of their extracurriculars, whatever their academics, um, there's just, I think for all of them, there are different things going on. Right. Yeah. I had a guest earlier this week. Her name's Sona. She is um, Conan. She was Conan O'Brien's assistant for years. And now she's like his sidekick on their podcast. They have a podcast together. Um, and she said something that has stuck with me. I know she said, I said stuff that stuck with, that really rang a bell for her. But this I keep bringing back all week long. And she said she realized at some point she was a 60 percenter. She was not a 110 percenter. And Conan is a 110 percenter. And she's a person who just wants to put 60 percent in at her job. Now she's 110 percent as a mom, 110 percent in her marriage. But in life, like life, 60 is good. And I was like, interesting. I think I expect 110 from myself everywhere. And I wonder what if just I put that percentage on my expectations for certain parts of my life, how that would make me feel. If it would make me feel differently about my life. It may not change the pace or the workload or, or the schedule. But just the shift in focus, like in my one of my early podcasts, remember I talked about eight, 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 Mm -hmm. the eight hours for work, eight hours for sleep, eight hours for whatever I want. And I had really put my life into like a six and was that 18 (laughs) where I had 18 hours of work and six hours of sleep. Right. But just that mental focus of wait, Girl Scouts is not work. That's whatever I want. And working out is not work. That goes in whatever I want. And it shifted my the way I looked at my very scheduled day. So this week I've been thinking about this 60%. Maybe that's not the right percentage for, for everybody. Maybe it's 80, maybe 75. But even Leo, our business manager, said, everybody in your company should only be working at about 80%. If people are working at more than 80%, that 20% is where create critical thinking comes to play, where creativity, where problem solving comes in. That's where um, all this creativity happens in that extra 20%. So if you're working at 110, there's no space for mm-hmm. anything new to come in. So and there's definitely space for burnout. <laughs> that's, uh, right. that's about the only direction you can head, right, uh, over long term. So this whole week I've been thinking about her comment and thinking, well, where can I, if I can't reduce myself, may I, I'm going to go back and think about that 888 mm-hmm. structure and put things in place for myself because that really helped me. But that is a habit to kind of think about your day in that structure. Yeah, I stopped thinking about my day that way, but you changed my mindset that day when we talked about the 888 um, because I had been looking at walking the dogs as work, (laughs) as just another damn thing on my list. Mm -hmm. And I realized then, oh no, I love my dogs so much. (laughs) I'm really into my dogs. Um, So I began to see it as something that I did for myself, Uh um, that it was my time with my animals. And that has never changed. I mean, there are, there's the odd day here and there where I'm flying by the seat of my pants and I'm like, 
I gotta walk the dogs. And then I literally stop myself and I go, I get to walk the dogs. Right. That's a really mm-hmm. powerful thing, that mm-hmm. 888. Yeah. And I've forgotten about it. As my rat race has continued to grow and shift, I forgot about that. And that 60% thing she said was really helpful because I have thought to myself, do I need to 110% loading my dishwasher? <laughs> I probably don't. Yeah. If I get my dishwasher 80%, I'm pretty good. But I just, I just, everything I do, I try to do my very best, mm-hmm. you know, and that's what I've taught both my girls by proxy mm-hmm. because I don't do anything halfway. And why is it bad to do something halfway? My takeaway from what she was saying is why is it bad to do something 60%? As long as you get your work done, you know, as long as you're not, you know, in some detrimental state because you're working at 60%. But just the, the thought of that mentality relieved me of a bunch of stress where I, I don't, maybe today I don't check all of my emails. I just check 60% of them. Mm-hmm. And then tomorrow I check 60% and then tomorrow, every, maybe that's a bad example because at some point I'll be 100% behind. <laughs> but you see what I mean, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know. I think I'm going to go back to that 888 and that I'm going to adjust my percentages. Regardless, we've been talking a long time and we're going to force our our girls into, are you there, God, it's me, Margaret. And guess what? It might be really good for them to go back in time to being a middle schooler Mm -hmm. and imagine and think how far they've come as young adults since they were that age, you know, 12 or whatever. Not so long ago for some of them, but we're about to have seniors in high school. Yeah. Holy cow. (laughs) Well, thanks for reading The Good Earth. Mm -hmm. It was a great choice. Yeah, it was. was Thank you, Felicia. Because Felicia Wilson recommended it. So thank you, Felicia. Oh, yeah, go Felicia. Thank you, Felicia. For the, uh, for the choice. And she listens too. So thank you, Felicia. We love Yay, you, Felicia. Yes, we did. <laughs> bring it, bring it. Any more suggestions, Felicia? Bring mm-hmm. them on. Um, all right. Well, I can't wait for our retreat next week. Me too. It'll be fun. Yeah. It's going to be, be fun. Very fun. Yeah. All right. Till next time. Bye.